be a more of just a discussion type. Yo, where is? What's that? Or not. I told her to stay away from me. Yes. Hey, on your guys is a little reclamation craft. I bought this truck from the BLM here the other day, so I just put a flatbed on it. Did you use that government GSA auction? Yeah. Yeah. It looks familiar. Who needs that? Who needs that? That box. Recording
Duke Brothers Seeds Hunting Exchange up for sale at once. Seize all assets of Duke and Duke Commodities Brokers, as well as all personal holdings of Randolph and Mortimer Duke. You and your snowbound pies! You idiot! Speculators are evil, right? That's what we hear in the news. All they're trying to do is just make all this money and uh, that's why gas is going up. And, but why are those people there doing that? What's the purpose of it? Yeah, something like that. Set a value in the market. They're willing to take the risk of the market going up or down and try to make money with risk comes reward, right? And it is a way for us to take our risk and give it to them. Um, which you can go deeper into the, there are certain things with the oil speculators that might need to be done, like they have to put money down or, you know, there are things. But as far as the concept of people speculating being an evil thing, all they're doing is willing to take the risk of the people who have to buy oil or sell oil who don't want that risk. They're taking that risk on. Okay. Uh, you have, I know you have cattle. I know y'all have cattle. You have cattle? I'll say. Okay, so we'll try to keep this more around the beef cattle, cow calf operation. Um, do you have risk? Are you exposed to price risk right now? What happens if uh, some study comes out and says that, you know, we've got mad cow, we got, we run a risk of price going down. Last several years, we haven't had that. It's going up and it's been great. But if price uh, prices right now went from I think they're at a dollar fifty-five, dollar sixty right now on on the market. If it went down to a dollar ten or a dollar fifteen, would you lose money or make money? Depends which side of it you're going to play. Well, and we're the purpose of this is not to really play either side. Um, is to <coughs> kind of cover ourselves on both sides. Um, what do you rough guessment? And you don't have to give me specific on your numbers, but. What is roughly break even on uh, cow calf operation around here? Each operation is a little different, but per pound, what's it take you to raise a calf? Buck twenty. Buck twenty. Okay. Uh, would you be willing to pay a penny and a half if I could promise you that you won't get less than a dollar forty next November? Would it be worth a penny and a half to set a net at a dollar forty? Yeah, probably. Okay. We're gonna go through the the process of futures and then options. And with the options, it's kind of like buying insurance. Um, but you can basically do it. All right. With the risk, there's three things you can do with it. You can accept it, which means I have the calves. I can't sell my calves until most around here, most people sell them around October, early November. Can't sell them until then. I won't make you know, they gotta be weaned. They got, first I gotta have them, then they gotta be weaned and, and all that. Okay, so I can't sell them to now and then, so I have the risk of prices for some reason going down between now and then. Um, there's three things I can do with that risk. I can accept that risk, which means I have the calves, I don't do anything else. If the prices go up, things are great. If the prices go down, I took on that risk and I lost. Okay. I can get rid of a risk, which means I sell out of the cattle business and, and not deal with it. Or I can transfer the risk. And that's the reason we've set up these markets, the Chicago Board of Trade and all, and all these people in Chicago who've never seen a cow are willing to sit there and, and scream at each other and all trying to buy it is they're accepting the risk. And when they accept the risk, and then prices either go up or prices go down and they make money off of it. And they can make money off of both sides. Okay. So we want to transfer the risk. And to transfer the risk, we can hedge our product, okay? Um, it's kind of like having a teeter-totter. On 
this side is the cash market, and on this side is the futures market. Okay. And we want it set up to where if prices go down, we lose money in the cash market. If prices go up, we make money in the futures market. They offset each other, or vice versa, right? So let's get kind of some clarity on what the cash market is, what the futures market is, and, and because a lot of times people merge the two together and, and are, that's one of the places, this gets very confusing. Um, and that's one of the places people get confused. Cash market is physical calves that you have that you're going to sell for a price at wherever you sell them. Okay, that is the actual physical market. A completely separate thing is the futures market, which is trading paper. But the two are tied together price-wise. Doesn't mean they're exactly the same, but they're tied together price-wise. Okay, so if I have calves right now, what are 600 weight calves selling for cash market? 60. Okay, so. Um, that's about a 14 cent basis because right now futures markets they're selling for about a dollar 44 what are some of the differences when we're selling calves cash market and, and our calf crop well, that's right now. The futures might be up. Which one is it? Th that's January that I'm January. looking at right oh, now. Okay. Okay. Now November, it's showing a dollar sixty-three. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if there's still a fourteen cent basis at that time, it's saying a good bit more. And we're going to talk about basis a little bit through this. Basis is the difference between the cash price and the futures price, and we still have a risk when we're doing this of a change in basis. We will have a change in basis. But instead of a change in the whole dollar sixty or whatever, it's a change in the you know ten or fifteen cents. Okay, so it might change one or two cents versus twenty, thirty, forty cents. All right. Contract specifications on a futures contract, which a futures contract is, which you can buy or sell. A lot of people can't get past the thing that you can sell something you don't have, right? But it's nothing but a sheet of paper. It's like having this sheet of paper that says, if we were to do a November 2013 futures contract, it is a sheet of paper that says, I will deliver 50,000 pounds of 650 to 850 pound steers, medium, large, number one, number two, to a certain point for this price. Okay. And I will do it on the last Thursday of November. So you can either, if you sell it, go short, then you're saying, I'm going to deliver it um, in, you know, at the end of this class, I will deliver 50,000 pounds right there, okay? It's got a specified time, it's got a specified. Now, are any of y'all going to be selling 650 to 850 steers only? No. And so, it, but it doesn't matter. That price and, and the cash price will be tied strongly together. Okay. If I sell this and it says I've got to deliver at the end of November and it's sometime between the time now and the time that I have to do that, I go and buy one that says I'll accept delivery. The two cancel each other out, right? There's no need me driving to Chicago with a load of steers because I'm going to accept delivery of one and I'm going to to deliver a truckload and I'm going to accept delivery of a truckload. I just take the two and put them back, right? 97% of futures contracts are never delivered on. It is a paper game. It is nothing but paper. So you sell one now, and before it is up, you buy it back. Okay. But if I sell it at a dollar fifty, and I buy it back at a dollar fifty-five, what happened? It's money. No, I lost fifty-six five cents. I lost five money. Cents. I sold it at dollar fifty. I buy it back at a higher price. I lost money. Or I can make money either way in the cash market, right? So we've got all these people who are speculating doing this. They don't own cows. They've never stepped on a ranch. They don't know what a cow looks like. And they're doing this hoping to make money. 
they're taking the price risk from you. Okay? So let's go slowly through this, what we would do if we were actually wanting to, uh, to try to set that. Would you, first thing you got to do is make sure that you are getting a contract that as closely represents what you have as you can. Cow-calf is easy. What is set up is, uh, is your feeder cattle contract. And it is set up for cow calf. It's not going to match what you do. A lot of people right here sell them a little bit lower and they get a bonus, right? Lower weights, higher premium, higher price. But this is the contract that you would use for this. All right. In the cash market, in one way, I always spread this out a little bit. I always try to keep it written down. Because if I don't, I get confused on it. All right. In the cash market, I've got, let's say I'm running 70 cow calves, or I'm planning on having 70 calves to sell. Okay. So, 70, what weight do most people around here sell them at? What do y'all want to sell our calves at? Six. 600. If I had 70 calves at 600, I'm going to have 42,000 pounds of calves to sell. Calf beef to sell. Come next November, right? Okay. So I have 42,000 pounds. Now, some of the terminology people get mixed up on is long, short, not that. I am long here. I have calves. They're in mama's tummy right now, but I have calves. I am long. To hedge, I want to take the opposite position in the futures market. So I want to be short. And if someone, if you ask somebody, hey, can I borrow 20 bucks? They say, no, I'm short right now. That means they don't have it, right? So I want to sell. Now, which with cattle, it's in 50,000 pound increments. So I would sell one contract, and that would be short. I'm short one futures contract, which is 50,000 pounds. So, and we'll deal with the difference in size in just a minute, but so let's look at it right now. You said right now um, it's $1.60 or so in the cash market. And November 2013 is $1.63. So there's a three cent basis right there. this market and I have from now until November to not worry about what the prices do. Getting our little time travel ship and we go forward and it's time to sell our cattle in October next year. And prices went up. This price now, um, let's say that this price went up 10 cents. Um, so I sell my 42,000 pounds in the cash market, however you normally do it, whether you have a buyer, whether whatever, you sell your 42,000 pounds and things were good at $1.70. Okay. Over here, to make the round turn, to get rid of that paper, right? I have to buy back one contract and let's say there's not a change in basis right now, so I buy it back at 173.
my seesaw went like this. I made money over here, I lost money over here. I made 10 cents, excuse my hand, right, per pound, and I lost 10 cents per pound over here, right? Question is, was I willing to take a dollar sixty, roughly, today? Would you be willing to take a dollar sixty today for your calves next November? Somebody came and said, "Hey, they're worth a dollar sixty. Are you willing to take it?" Um, some people are. Some people aren't. You might want to stay, say, "No, I'm going to accept the risk, and I think prices are going to go up, and I want to take it." That's a decision to make, and that's fine. I'm not saying you can't make that decision. And if you say no, I would love to have lock in a dollar sixty, and and that's where I'm going. All right, a couple of things to look at on this. First is how to figure net hedge selling price. That's what you actually get in the cash market. So we had forty-two thousand pounds times dollar seventy. Okay. So in the cash market, I got a check for $71,400. Plus gain or loss in the futures market, okay? And in the futures market, I lost 10 cents per pound on 50,000 pounds. We are over hedged a little bit because it doesn't match up exactly. So I lost five thousand dollars. Gives me sixty-six thousand four hundred dollars. Is how much money I actually get to put into my checking account after we do all this, right? Sixty-six thousand four hundred divided by forty-two thousand pounds. I got a dollar fifty-eight for my cap. This is the basic concept of how hedging works. Y'all see where we went on this, thing, right? These two markets are two completely different things, and the only time they come together is when I'm depositing money in my checking account. Okay. Now, which with grains it's not as bad because most grain contracts are 5,000 bushels. With cattle, it's 50,000 pounds. That's a pretty big block that you have to buy or don't buy. So you have to usually either uh, over hedge, which means buy more pounds than cattle you would have, or under hedge. In this situation, we didn't have a choice because we didn't quite have 50,000 pounds, but um, say I have 75,000 pounds of cash that I'm planning on selling. Okay, So I either have to buy one contract or two contracts. Here's where I'm going to be off balance just a little bit, one way or the other. So I'm going to be speculating that prices are either going to go up or going to go down. Um, I think prices are probably going to go up on cattle next year because hopefully the inventory, I mean the inventory is so low that surely prices are going to come back, right? So I buy one contract. That way I have 50,000 pounds of the calves that I've got hedged and 25,000 are out there on their own depending on what, you know, what the market's going to do. So y'all understand that concept? If you have, you, you underhedge, you think the market's going to go up. You overhedge, you think the market's going to go down. Because you can't make it match exactly what you're growing. Let's go back to this one for just a second and say that instead of here selling for $1.73, I sell it for $1.75. So then, I'm not to sell. I bought it back for $1.75, so I lost 12 cents a pound there. My basis changed. If I do that, 12. I lost $6,000. Instead of five, so it would be 65,400. Which would change that by a penny or two. Okay. The basis will change a little bit. It won't be exactly three cents difference or ten cents difference or whatever it is. 
but it will change a lot less than what the market can change. So does that, everybody kind of understands the concept that we're going through right now, right? One of the tools I use in class is this mock trading, uh, mocktrading.com. I have all my students go and they sign up and get an account. And they you just practice trading. Um, I give each of my students $100,000 and you go on it and, and it teaches you how to, to trade. So if we wanted to, If we were in a real life situation, we would have a broker somewhere. I think there's one in Riverton, I think there's one in Billings, I'm not sure where all they are. And you open an account with them, okay? You send them money. And I would call them up and say, hey, I need to hedge my calves. I want to go short one future uh, November uh, feeder cattle contract, right? One of the good things about this is that we get to use leverage, which means we don't have to put up the whole 50,000 pounds times a dollar sixty is uh, 50,000. It's a little over seventy-five thousand dollars. We don't have to put up seventy-five thousand dollars to do that. You do have to put up about ten percent, so that's seventy-five hundred dollars. Okay, and in this situation where I'm losing money in the futures contract. When I get to down to where my margin account has like five or six thousand dollars in it, they call me up and say, "Hey, send us a check." It's called a margin call. So there's that is a problem with using a futures contract. Okay. Another problem with a futures contract is, what if this price went to a dollar eighty or a dollar ninety? What happens? Do great over here, I lose that much over here, right? So I'm locked into that roughly $1.58, $1.60 market, and I can't take advantage of any of those. So that's when they came up with the idea of options. Okay. Questions on where we've gotten to so far? It, and please, it, I get confused. I have to keep it written down. Ask questions, because it's not a problem. Uh, questions? She sat through the class last semester. This is trading full time now. Then. <laughs> yep. What's well, the typical commission? commission? Hey. <laughs> um, I don't remember what you did. Okay, we had one student make fifty thousand uh, dollars. You can see I lost twenty something thousand dollars, but this was just pure speculating versus setting the hedge. And there is a huge, huge difference. I will do my disclaimer. If you get into leverage, is great. You can get into this and you can make a lot of money real fast speculating. And you can lose your butt real fast speculating. So that's my disclaimer. I'm not telling anybody to go out speculating and, and becoming brokers on this. What's the typical commission per trade? Oh, um, most places are like 50 bucks. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not a very expensive situation. Um, one risk that came to light recently is, uh, I mean, have y'all heard about NF Global? Did y'all see that in the news last year? Um, John Corzine, who was the governor of New Jersey, had MF Global, which is a huge worldwide brokerage company, and they were stealing all the money out of this. This available cash here is my money that I sent down there, and they're not supposed to do anything but make my trades with them. And he raided billions of dollars out of that. And there's a lawsuit from one of a uh, big uh, wheat farmer up in Montana, was one of the ones that got kind of Messed out of the deal. Um, so you want to kind of know who you're dealing with. Um, but I don't guess that's any bigger of a risk than somebody backing up to your uh, to your cattle one night and, and taking off with a couple. I mean, if someone's going to steal from you, someone's going to steal from you sometimes. All right. So we got this works. It helps offset our risk transfer that risk to someone who's willing to do it, but it's got two big limitations. One is the cash flow. You know, I said we don't have to come up with a full 75,000, we only have to come up with 7,500, but $7,500 is a lot of cash to tie up all year, right? 
Plus, they give you the margin calls that you can't control always and tell you to keep going, keep going, keep going. The other problem is that if the market was to run, you can't enjoy any of that upward movement in the price. All right. So the next thing they came up with is an options contract. Um, and all of y'all ever dealt with like a land purchase option? You know, I've got the right to buy a piece of property within the next six months or a year, but I don't have to. I'll pay you a premium for it. You know, I might give you fifteen hundred dollars for a purchase option to to buy that twenty acres over there for at three thousand dollars an acre. But I need to. I'm not going to make that decision until I've okay, got until next January to make that decision. Well, what if we could do this right here, same way? And that's what they do now. Okay. I don't have to sell this right now. I buy an option to sell this, and it gives me that opportunity. Okay. One thing to remember in keeping it simple is you will always, if you're doing a production hedge, you will be long in cattle because you are producing cattle, or you will be long in corn because you are producing corn, and so you will always go short on the futures market, taking that opposite position to offset your see something, right? So we can do this now with an options contract instead of buying a futures contract. Options. Uh, man. Oh, hold on. Which this that I'm looking at is cmegroup.com. This is Chicago Board of Trade. This is what they're actually at this moment trading for. All right. So November is trading at $1.63. I hit the little options button right here. I'm going to change. When you hear them talk about at the money, in the money, or out of the money, at the money is a strike price, which the strike price is the price at which if I decide to exercise, I can buy something for. Okay? If I have a land purchase option and I'm going to be allowed to buy that piece of property at $3,000 an acre, that 3000 is the strike price. Okay. The premium is how much I paid for that option. I may pay $1,000 for that option. Okay. Do I ever get that $1,000 back? No. It's, it's like buying insurance. It's, I'm giving you $1,000 to hold the right for me to do this. So premium and earnest money are one and the same? No. Earnest money you get back unless you break a contract for some reason. Okay, say I'm buying a piece of property, buying a house, and I put up earnest money, but it's contingent upon an inspection, and I go into that inspection and, and say, I, I don't like the way that door looks. It looks like it's crooked to me. They give me my earnest money back. Premium is kind of like an insurance. Once you buy it, that money's gone. All right. So you'll hear them talk about add the money which at the money is a strike price that is the same as what that contract is trading at. Right now, November 2013 feeder cattle contracts are trading at $1.63.87. Okay. This is 100 weight, so it's $163 per 100 weight or $1.63 a pound. And, and not to mess you up, but the... No, I ask questions for going on this. Comparative to today, we were at 140. Twenty cents higher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Why would it be? Why would the price be twenty cents higher next November than it is right now? No volume. Pe well, people think that there's going to be a shortage. We're looking at supply and demand. And one difference between um, cattle and grains is grain. If price is not good today, I can add cost of storage and keep it for a year. I can't keep a calf a calf for a year. Um, a 600 pound calf is going to be different two weeks from now than what he is now. So you don't really have a cost of storage in there. Okay? So people right now are betting that there's going to be a shortage of supply next November. And the, so they're saying, hey, we think the price is going to be $1.63. Now, it might be a little different cash price, but the two are tied together. Okay? So add the money means a strike price of $1.63 at this moment. Out of the money 
if we are doing a, and in this situation we would look at a put option. A put option is the right to put away, a right to sell something, which when I sell it, it makes me go short. So we would always look at put options as a producer. Now if you're running the, the grain elevator and you've got to buy, you're on the other side of this, okay? But a put option, if it is out of the money, means that I would have the right to sell it at some price less than $1.63. Okay? Like $1.60. So if I was holding an option for $1.60 right now, would I exercise it? Would I go buy it out there for $1.63 so that I could sell it for $1.60? I wouldn't, right? So that means it's out of the money, which means it's cheaper. Or you can buy one that's in the money. I can go buy a put option right now. It gives me the right to sell it for $1.65 a pound. I can go buy it for $1.63 out on the market, turn around and sell it for $1.65, make two cents, but the option's going to cost me more, right? It's got intrinsic value in it. Okay. So that's what people are talking about when you hear them say, at the money, out of the money, or in the money. I'm going to change our strike range to all. And we are looking for put options, right? Gives us the right to sell or be short in the futures market. And you said you can grow cash for, say, $1.20. Well, for a cent, 1.15 cents per pound, I can have a dollar 42 put option. It gives me the right to sell my cattle for a dollar 42, my futures contract. Okay. So if I subtract my premium out, it's going to cost me a dollar 15. Once I spend that, it's gone. But if I subtract that out, then I'm looking at putting a target price there of a little over a dollar 40. A little less than dollar forty one, about dollar forty and a half. And that's for the same delivery time? That is for a November this is a November two thousand and thirteen, which you always want your contract to be just past where you think you would sell your cattle. Okay. Did you ever sitting on the at the playground sitting on the seesaw when some kid was gonna be a smart ass and get off real fast and it boom and bumps your butt? You want to get off the seesaw at the same time, okay? So you want a contract that if I'm planning on selling in October or early November, November contracts are usually what's used. So now for a cent per pound, I can basically tell you, hey, you're not going to go broke. It's insurance in that situation, okay? Is that it, is, is it typically that big of a split though? Um, that is way out of the money. They're thinking it's going to be a dollar sixty something. This is like having a huge deductible on your car insurance. Okay. Um, I can come down here and get in the money. I see what you're doing. Okay. And I can get the right to sell it for a dollar eighty a pound. But it's going to cost me eighteen cents a pound to do it. Okay. By doing that, dollar eighty minus let's say twenty for easy math for me. I just put a target price of $1.60 on this. I'm pretty much guaranteeing, not guaranteeing, I am, I'm putting that safety net around that $1.60. And we're going to go through this in a minute and see how it would actually work out. But it cost me $0.18 cents a pound to do it. And because of these prices, it's looking to me like the speculators are saying, they, you know, we're thinking $1.60, but it very likely could go a good bit higher. And we don't think, because it's so cheap up here, we don't think that it's going to get down to $1.40. All right. A couple of things to remember is, is as a producer, on basic marketing, you always want to buy an option. You don't want to sell an option. Now, once you get really into it, you can sell options to offset some of the premium people give you that premium and it offsets and there's all kind of different games out there that can be played but for the basic concept and the basic setting a hedge you would buy a put option okay it gives you the right to sell all right so let's walk through then one of the the really cheap 
just a little bit of insurance, this is catastrophe insurance. If something wants to crash the market for some reason, such as mad cow disease coming out. Okay. One, two. So do you have a feel of how many people plan this are real producers versus speculators? Vast majority of speculators. And it's a wonderful thing because it gives us liquidity. On average, I can buy or sell in three minutes. Okay, it, let, it brings money in and it brings money out. Now, you can, don't think you can always get out that fast, especially if you're speculating, because it can be down the limit. Something come out and really screw up the grain market or something and nobody's willing to buy it. It's only allowed to go down so many cents per day. You can't, you know, if it's at $1.60 and something horrible comes out, uh, you can't drop to a dollar. It's got to go through a day of, of, and I'm not sure on cattle, we'll look at it, some of the contract specifications, but it's only allowed each day to go down so much. And is the limit a percentage? It, each contract is different. A lot of times it's a, a cents. You know, it's only allowed to go down three cents in a row or five cents. We'll look, look and see. Right quick on this one. Contract specifications, which is one of the reasons all this works, is the paper that we're buying and selling is exactly the same for everybody. Okay, I don't have to come out and look at your cattle to see if I like them or not. You know, if I told you, hey, I got a horse for sale and I want three thousand dollars for him, do you want it? I don't know what is he. You know, is it a rope horse? Is it just a nag? Or, but if I tell you I have a feeder cattle contract for sale, you know exactly what it is. All right. Um, Three cents per pound above or below the previous day settlement price is cattle. So if something changed the market, market dramatically and nobody's willing to pay to the dollar sixty-three today and nobody's willing to buy one until you get to like a dollar fifty and you were sitting there long holding one, you'd have to go through about three or four days of just sitting there twiddling your thumbs and watching yourself lose money. And that happens when you get to speculate. Okay. All right. Y'all want to use these numbers, or y'all want to make up numbers that might fit y'all better, or these numbers work? Okay. So just before we get into that, though, uh -huh. why is our cash market usually that much different than the CME? Um, because the biggest thing comes from around here, our cash market is on 600, 500, 600 weight, where this is 850 weight. Um, so that's one of the huge differences. Okay, another difference in cattle is going to be in trucking. Um, if I need cattle at uh, wherever the closest is here, uh, where, I'm not sure where the closest packing plant is. I guess down in Greeley, probably. Okay, um, and I have to go to Chicago to pick up my cattle and bring them back. I've got a cost there, cost of transportation which is more than my cost from here. So cost of transportation is put in there. When you're looking at uh, grain, cost of storage is also put in there. Okay. Um, but the biggest difference is you're getting a premium because your calves are lighter weight and possibly you know you get a little bonus for frame size, all that kind of stuff. Okay. On the CME though, isn't it a range that you're buying into? Closing at six two eight fifty. Mm -hmm. it, it is. Eight. Let's go back. To, this is CM, um, CME. Let's go back to the quotes. Give it a second. To CMEgroup.com, which Chicago Board of Trade, New York Mercantile Exchange, all of those have been consolidated and bought out, and that's what CMEgroup.com is. Um, feeder cattle. Live cattle, the difference between live cattle and feeder cattle, live cattle is heavier weight. This is what's coming out of the feedlot. Okay, so if you were running your own feedlot and wanting to do it, you'd use live cattle. Feeder cattle is the lighter weight. This is calves going into the feedlot. All right. So 
you're not buying into the last contract that traded was a dollar sixty three per pound, 0.875, 163,875 per hundred weight. So whoever sold or bought that contract, that is the exact price that they've got. Make sense? Yeah, I just, what's, what's our weight on that contract though? Is it specified? Yes, the, the contract specifications, it's right here, which this is a January, this is March, April, May, Contract specifications are 50,000 pounds of 650 to 849 pound steers, medium large number one and medium large one to two. It's based on a cents per pound or dollars per hundred weight. Okay, but if we're selling 600 weights, are we not in our own bracket there? No, this is the closest that matches us. Okay. Okay, and that's the reason we have that Macy's. <coughs> okay. They're going to run together though. They, they might not be exactly the same. But this is the closest that matches your 550 pound, 600 pound calves, okay? And, and that's, that's why the people from Chicago don't have to come out and look at your calves. No, it doesn't match it exactly, but they know exactly what they're buying. It standardizes it. Standardizes yours, and yours is 15 cents a pound better than what that standard is. So when you go to the cash market, you get a positive basis. Is that are you catching now? How, and that's one of the things a lot of people, it's hard to get that connection. It's, they're not the exact same thing, but they move in the same directions. And they move, this is based off of this. Okay? The people who are trading this are watching and knowing what the supply is. They're watching and they're knowing what the cash prices are actually going for. So it is a derivative, it's what they're called as derivative trading, because it derives its price from what is actually going on in the cash market. And there is a category of lighter weight cattle, right? The, the 550 weight group? Um, not in the futures contracts. I think they do with cash. But futures contracts are... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking to the wrong thing. I'm going to go back to agriculture. These are, through CME Group, which is the four largest, there's also the Winnipeg Grain Exchange, Kansas City, you know, there's other places that trade out there. But through the um, livestock, you have live cattle, you have lean hogs, lean, uh, and uh, feeder cattle. And the feeder cattle are the light ones. And, and that's what is used by the vast majority of everybody for hedging calves. And, and, and that, is that the weight group that we're in? Yep. We're in the live cattle. No, we were not in live cattle. Live cattle is a thousand or heavier. That's what I was talking about. If you have a feedlot and you're running feedlot and you're running heavier cattle out on the backside, you're, you're at risk that that price would go down. Okay. So we run feeder cattle. That, that is, what we're fixing to step through is buying a put option, which gives you the right to go short a feeder cattle, November feeder cattle contract. Okay. Not to confuse the two things, but I bought a policy through the RMA outfit. Uh -huh. I had steers locked at 850 and, and calves at 600. So okay. somehow they're, and it's based off the CME, so somehow they're pulling a different category there. No, they're doing the same thing. The basis is what makes the difference there. But when you go through the, the um, LRP, li um, Livestock Revenue Protections, what you're buying, they're taking you and 100 other farmers and are doing this exact same thing. And they're going in and they're doing this for you, charging a little bit of premium, the government offsets that premium for you. Um, the LRP is the same thing as what we're talking about right here. Uh, it's just having like Larry do it for you. Through an insurance policy, the company's putting it all together and they're, they're consolidating maybe 100 farms and hedging this way. Okay. The basis is what ties the two together difference in the cash versus the, the deal. Okay. So they'll, they'll go, if 100 of you sign up for it, and they see how much exposure they got, and when you do, they go out and they buy this. They're buying a feeder cattle option and to offset their risk, and they're charging a little bit of premium, which is what insurance companies do, for service to you. Government's nice enough, though, to come in and pay, I don't know, 
it is now. I think it was 16 point percent last year. Yeah, they're nice enough to come in and pay a little bit of the premium for you so that you will go do that uh, to give us a little bit of price stability. But it, it's, it's the same thing. Um, LRP we have in, in sheep and we have in cattle, they don't have the LRP yet for like wheat or corn or something like that. Okay. It, it is a great program and this plays right along in with that, especially if you don't have 50,000 pounds. If you're a small producer you only got 20 calves, you can't, you know, this doesn't work for you. LRP is the same thing. All right, so let's start over. Where's my eraser? Right now, let's say that we are running, we're planning on having 100 calves to sell, 600 pounds, next fall. Okay, we're calving out right now. We're gonna have 100 calves, um, next fall to sell at 600 pounds. So that's 60,000 pounds, okay? Cash market right now is $1.60. I have 60,000 pounds at $1.60 in the cash market. So, do I think or do you think that cattle prices are going to go up or down over the next year? Think they're going to go up? All right. So in our plan that we're putting together here, we're going to have that in the back of our mind. We think it's going to go up, and, and this is just to protect us for a worst case scenario, right? We just don't want to go broke. We don't lose it all. We want to lose it all in one year. All right. So I'm going to go into my feeder cattle. Right now it's trading at a dollar sixty-three, but I don't want to buy a futures contract. I want to buy an option. Okay. I don't want it at the money. I want to go to all, and I want to update it. Okay. Now I am long in the cash market. I have cattle. I have flesh on my place. Or we'll soon have flesh on my place, right? I want to offset, so I want to go short in the futures market. To go short in the futures market, I can either sell a futures contract or buy an option for the right to sell a futures contract, which would be a put option. So I want to buy a put option. Now, Couple of things to look at. What month do I want to buy it for? Yeah. November, right? Because I'm, I'm, our plan is to sell our cattle in either late October, early November. Okay. So I'm going to buy November put option. How many contracts do I need? One, two. Just one. If it's going up. One. Yeah, one. It's going if we up. think it's going up, we want one. That's going to leave us 10,000 pounds of actual cash market unhedged. If we bought two contracts, we would have 40,000 pounds of futures contract unhedged. Okay, that would be if we thought the price was probably going to go down. So we want to buy one put November feeder cattle contract. That gives us 50,000 pounds. Now, next thing we have to look at is how much insurance do we want to buy? feel fairly confident that the price is going to go up, right? I mean, more confident this year that the price is going to go up than most years. So we want to do as cheap to us as possible. We can grow calves at $1.20, we just don't want to lose money. And right now I can get $1.42 really, really cheap. This is an unusually good deal right now. People just are pretty adamant that prices are going to go up. And this is determined by all the people out there studying and thinking and and what they're willing to vote with with their dollars, right? Okay, so it cost me a dollar fifteen. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, a dollar fifteen per pound, not a dollar fifteen. 
1.15 cents per pound. So $1.1150 uh, $1 per hundredweight. So that's 1.5 cents, which is times 50. To calculate work. 0 0.0115 times 50,000 pounds. It's $575. So I have to send my commodities broker a check for $575 for the printing. On top of that, he's probably going to charge me $50 for his work, right? That's one cent per pound that I'm at. By doing that, I have a target price now of one note, uh, it's a dollar forty-two, one but strike price is a dollar forty-two. So I have a target price of about 141, 140.8, something like that. Now, see where I got that from? Mm -hmm. uh, I have the right to sell this, so I have a target price of a dollar, about a dollar forty. So now I have, I mean, it's it's set now. I've got my hedge set. You know, if we get in a big trade war with somebody and, and we don't export any beef or, yeah. Mad cow comes out, whatever, the price can go to crap, and I'm going to sit pretty good. So let's look at a couple of possible scenarios. First, let's say it does what we think it's going to do, and instead of a dollar sixty, we're able to sell them at dollar seventy-five next November. That means we would have to come back over here. We've got an option to sell at a dollar forty-two, but if we sold that contract at a dollar forty two, we'd have to go buy a contract to offset it, right? And we'd have to buy it at a dollar eighty, dollar eighty five. So what do we do with this option? Got a question? We'll no, flip right there. Let it just let it go. Let it go. I lost a dollar fifteen or I lost five hundred and seventy five dollars. I just let it go. Prices went up. I'm able to take all this money here and I just let that go and I don't worry about it. I didn't use my insurance, my car insurance. Didn't have a wreck this, this year. Good thing. Price went down a little bit, $1.50. What do I do? Let it go. I let it go. Because I've got to go buy it at a dollar, you know, dollar fifty. Too. So I still don't do anything. Something really screws up and prices go down to a dollar. I exercise my option. So I can go buy at a dollar and I can sell it at my strike price of $1.42. So let's look, actually look at our net hedge selling price up here. We got 60,000 pounds at a dollar. So I get a check from my buyer for $60,000. Okay. I exercise my option. Okay. So I'm allowed to sell. At a dollar forty-two, I can buy it at a dollar. That's a uh, forty-two cents difference. I don't like this calculator. Sorry. Um, times fifty thousand pounds. It's equal to twenty-one thousand dollars minus my five hundred seventy-five dollar premium. So that's twenty thousand four hundred twenty-five dollars. that I made in the paper market, right? Twenty thousand four twenty-five plus my sixty thousand here is eighty thousand four twenty-five. I'm gonna divide that by a dollar sixty. I'm sorry, I'll divide that by sixty thousand pounds. Dollar thirty-four per pound. I got. So, do you think it's true that a producer would be the, the save the wreck guy buying the the least volatile part of the chart, and the futures guy would be somewhere in the more volatile part? 
Um, no, the guy who was selling this is taking very little risk, so he's getting very little reward. But you've got somebody who's a trader out there who is selling this. He's willing to sell this, okay? But he's just not risking a whole lot. All right. Down here, this guy's risking a whole lot, the seller of the option, but he's also making a lot of money off of doing this. And when you get into these guys, they'll be selling here and buying here and selling there, and, and they've got to where if it does this, they make five cents, and if, it gets really complicated. A lot of times they don't even care about what the commodity is. They're just watching the charts and patterns and sell and buy. Um, those are, are, you have fundamental analysis <coughs> who are looking at supply and demand and, and production and all of that kind of stuff. And then you have technical analysis or people who are looking at charts. They think they see a double shoulder in there. They're going to do something, you know, and they're looking strictly at past performance of, of what it's done. Um, they're there to try to make money off of speculation, off of gambling. Um, as a rancher or a farmer, you can do that by not doing anything, just staying over here and seeing what happens. Um, I remember back in 95 or 96, Cattle market got really low, like it was 75, 80 cents a pound. Um, people were putting them the, back on the dairy calves, they were just putting them out at the end of the road. Uh, please take one. My brother was in college and he was actually making a little bit of money off of picking up free dairy calves and, and feeding them out. Um, it, it's just a, a tool for insurance. So Questions on it? So the RMA is basically the same thing yes. just with a subsidized mm -hmm. premium. And, and you've got, instead of calling a broker to do it, you've got an insurance company managing all this for you. Um, and, and it is a great program. Uh, um, that is part of my, when I do this, that is a way of doing this. And that, you know, I would not tell you to go and do this by yourself. I would say find a broker who understands and knows you and, and that you can trust to help you with this. Okay. Um, and the insurance, the LRP programs are, are great programs, and, and it's this is what it is. Yeah. It's just the insurance companies handling it for you. Last year in July, it was falling pretty hard. Uh -huh. uh, I missed by like three days of where I should have bought it had mm -hmm. fallen. Uh, two days after I bought, they wouldn't allow you to buy it anymore. It had fallen so hard. Yep. So I thought I was in a heck of a position. I was 200 steer calves at 600 and 100 uh, eight plate yearlings. Cost me roughly 7,000 to buy the policy for a October, end of October delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, when it was all said and done, I thought I was in a heck of a position because end of October, they weren't worth shit. Uh, I made like 500 bucks after tying my money up all summer long. I thought if it was ever going to pay, that should have been a year that it would have. Um, it, it comes down to what, how much of, you know, what the strike price is and how they set it up and all. I, I'd have to look at your policy and to say... I, I'd like someone to analyze it because uh, it looks to me like as <laughs> much as that small. But at, at 200, you said you had 200 calves? Yeah. Times 600 weight. That's uh, 120,000 pounds. So seven divided by 120. Uh, you pay five cents a pound for it. This year it's set up. You can now you're only going to get paid off if the premium drop, the price drops way low, below a dollar forty. Okay, but for a cent a pound, you can do it. On that. So. And there's other things you can do. Also, if you don't do this if you have a forward contract. Forward contract is another way of transferring the risk. If you've got a buyer that gives you a forward contract, he is taking the price risk, right? Because you've agreed to the price up front. This is just one way of doing it. And, uh, and, and I come from grain country, and, and this gets used a lot. Um, now, I had a farmer, an example of what you get, your butt burned pretty fast on it is I had a farmer who 
hedged his rice crop, 1,000 acres of rice. So he went out, he was long rice, he went out and sold on the futures market and was hedged nicely. The aerial uh, applicator sprayed his rice and killed him. So he just lost 1,000 acres of rice and it's gone right here. Well, during that time, the price of rice had gone up, so he had to get out of his hedge. That was the kid jumping off the seesaw on him real fast. Price went up, and he lost money on that. Um, not a big deal. The aerial applicators, the egg pilot's responsible, right? He got seven farms. He had less than $100,000 worth of insurance, and the Richards alone had a million dollar loss. So, you know, train wrecks can still happen. Uh, that was one of the worst I've ever seen. That and then the deal with uh, John Corzine and the MF Global. Um, that was a pretty bad deal. Uh, but this is a, a very standard way of hedging that risk. The question is, how much does it cost me? And that's one thing that you need to know. How much does it cost me? What are my actual production costs? Um, you know, my production, and how much of a hit can I take? And then the, the better off you get, the less insurance you have to buy, right? Because you can absorb a bad year if something wants to go wrong. And that way you make more money. Questions? Anything you want to talk about? You want to run through? Does it make a little more sense to you the, the way we did it this year than the way I did it two years ago? Uh, two years ago, I tried to put the whole book into it, you know, the whole course into it. And, and I was hoping that maybe it's just actually walking through and putting a hedge on it would work. Yep. So do you play a steel? No. Now, I don't produce, and so I'm not going to speculate. Um, growing up, my family had a grain elevator, and we used this tool as hedging. I do not recommend to speculate. Um, I lost 70, I lost from 100,000 to 78,000 last semester playing with the kids because I wasn't watching it every day. And you can lose your butt fast. You can also make a lot of money real fast. Um, the only way I would get into speculating is if that became my full-time job and I was watching the market constantly. Uh, since I don't produce, I don't have anything to offset. Right. That's all I got. Unless y'all got other questions, want to look at another one or... Still yeah, the latest leverage, do you have to be Oh, it's scary. It's scary, uh, especially in the futures. And, and that's the reason I also say get with somebody. You know, your broker needs to be a good find the right person. One. Yeah, and, and you get into situations um, when you get big enough, and with grain it's a little different because it's a 5,000 bushel contract versus 50,000. So I may buy 15, 20 bushel, 20 contracts with that. And if I think the prices are going up, well, I want to play a little bit, well I'll buy one contract when I, and then I'll buy another contract and I'll buy, you know, I can stagger out when I buy them based on what I think the market's going to do. And, and there's all kinds of different um, strategies and all out there to doing this. This is just the basic, I don't want to play, I don't want to lose my money, I just want to, to put a hedge, I want to be able to put my head down and know that you know, I'm doing good and, and farm versus <coughs> resist the temptation. <laughs> so they haven't changed the volume you can buy. I mean, for instance, in '96, one prices were 80 cents now versus they be worth twice that much. You think at some point, do you think they'll ever mm, say you can buy 25,000 pounds of that 50,000? Um, I, I don't know. You talking about changing the contract specifications? Maybe if the prices go super high um, or something some days tonight. I don't think so because a lot of that has to do simply with the inflation. If you adjust it for it back to real money, it's, it's going to be about the same. Yeah. And and the whole purpose of this is to let the market bear what it'll bear. This is the closest thing to true perfect competition you'll ever find. Everybody's got the same amount of information. It just depends on how much you want to go get. You can get in and out quickly. There's, it only cost me 50 bucks to buy 50,000 pounds of cattle. You know, if I want to actually start farming cattle, I got to go buy land. I got to go buy fencing and, and heifers and wait for them to uh, get them bread, wait them to have the cat. You know, it's three years down the road before I'm selling calves and lots and lots of money. And during that time, the market goes down. I can't get out of it. It's not 
perfectly competitive market. This, I can get in and out of usually within three to four minutes. I've got as much information as anybody else has. So it's a, uh, and that's what it's set up for, so that farmers can transfer that risk to people who want that risk, not just farmers, you can do it on anything. If you're running a, uh, a ski resort, you can do this with weather based on snow days. And you got people who are, are chain, uh, trading weather derivatives because if I'm running Red Lodge Snow Resort and we're not getting any snow this year, I'm not making as much money. I have a risk. So for a producer that doesn't want to play that, is the market helping or hurting? I mean, it doesn't affect him really. This is the tail, this is the dog. The cash market is the dog. Sometimes the tail will, will wag the dog. In a couple of years ago that uh, I think some of the grain prices that really ran up high was from speculators. There's no doubt it's happening in the oil market. That's what this video is about. There's too many speculators in it and it's driving the price up. It's, it's making a false demand. Well, even this fall and winter wheat, I mean, I was sitting on some and, and every time there was a news release, the uh -huh. thing would jump to the business of bushel. They've definitely gotten tired because oil, corn can now be made into, so, and then wheat replaces the corn. So they're getting more tied together. And there is a little bit, and I talked to the guy that was here at lunch yesterday about this topic, how much is the speculation um, affecting the ag commodities. He said it was, a couple of years ago it was a little more than it is now. Um, everybody was afraid that the dollar was going to collapse and they were, you know, it, it made for a little bit of work. Um, and it, it, it really tied it into the energy industry too. Right, which yeah. which it is now. You know, yeah. Food and, and energy are tied tightly together. Um, when that video I showed at the beginning, they're talking about uh, all speculators should be kicked out. They shouldn't be kicked out, but right now they can go and they can buy and sell without putting the margin up. Uh, you can adjust the margins before they actually have to put a little bit of money. Right now they have on the leverage, they don't have to use anything. And, and that causes people to jump in and out more. We, we regulated it a little, oh, sorry. Come on. We regulated a little bit. But we still want the speculators there because the purpose of them is so that people who are running an oil company knows what they're going to get.